This is Residential Landscape Design with Steve Huddleston. Uh, for over 25 years, Steve has been the senior horticulturalist at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. He co-authored the book Easy Gardens for North, North Central Texas and writes for Texas Living Magazine. He also manages his own landscape design and installation company. He's a busy guy. Uh, you can hear Steve on Sundays at 8 a.m. on radio station WBAP, where he makes a weekly report on Neil Sperry's Home and Garden Show. So I think many of you probably follow um, not only Neil Sperry, but uh, Steve Huddleston. So we're really glad you're here. Uh, and if everyone, if you've unmuted yourself, please mute yourself again. I think we're all covered there. Um, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and turn it over. Share screen. So what we're doing now is getting his screen up on your screen. Yes, I'm going to see. Okay, there we go. Yeah, you, there we go. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay, good. Okay, well, I guess we're ready to start, are we? We are. Let me just re reiterate one more time. If you have questions for Steve, please put them in the chat. And then I'll be going over them as Steve is teaching. And then every so often he'll ask me if there are any questions and I'll present them. So that's the best way to get your questions in. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess we're good to go now. Uh, we're looking at residential landscape design. And thank you for joining me today. Uh, landscaping is one of my passions. And so uh, hopefully I can give you some good ideas for landscaping your own uh, residence. And let's see, I'm trying to advance this. Well, hmm. I'm not having any success advancing to the next frame. Well, of course, when we practiced this yesterday, it went beautifully. <laughs> yeah, I thought, yeah, how do I could grieve? I just want to advance this thing. Well, I don't even see a space down here at the bottom where I can manage it from the bottom. Can so you try to... Oh, wait, let's see. Here, okay, those There we go, go. There, we go. there we go. Okay. There we go, there we go. Very good. So, okay, here we go. Yeah, I think we're good to go. So uh, every landscape has uh, three regions or should, for example, your house, the inside of your house has certain rooms. Uh, you have uh, an entry hall where you invite people into your home. You have a living room where you entertain people. You have a kitchen and a utility room where you do utilitarian things that you really don't want others to see necessarily. And then you may have a, a, a den where you lounge with family and friends. You're very comfortable there. Well, in the same way, the, the landscape is divided into rooms. And you need to think of three distinct areas in your landscape. The first is the public area. This is what the public sees. Uh, this is for the owners and the public's enjoyment. This is curb appeal. So when people drive by your house, this is what they see from the street and you want it to look nice. There's also the service area. This is what you don't want people to see. Uh, an area where you may have trash cans, the clothesline, uh, storage, uh, items, bricks, uh, cinder blocks stacked, maybe a chicken coop or a dog run. You want this out of sight. And then there's the private area. This is where you relax and entertain. Usually this is in the backyard. So let's look at uh, some examples of these things here. All right, here's my first slide. Now, if I were standing in front of you and I could hear you, I would interact with you at this point. And I would say, uh, what do you notice about this space? This is the public area. This is what people see from the curb. Well, I'll answer my own questions, I guess. So I'm looking at this uh, front yard here. And first of all, my eye follows that curving sidewalk up to the front door and to the front door. So the front door really should be the focal point of your front yard, of the public area. There should be no question as to where the front door is. The eye should be easily led to the front door. Now, I want you to look at the uh, sidewalk. Of course, if I were in front of you, I, I would ask you, what do you notice about the sidewalk? Well, for one thing, it's not a straight line. It's a curving line. C 
curving lines force us to slow down and walk more slowly through the landscape. Keep that in mind. If this were a straight line, it would be a straight shot to the front door. You know, you would get there in no time and you wouldn't take time to slow down and walk through that landscape a little more leisurely, taking in everything around you. So the curving sidewalk forces us really to slow down and take things in. Secondly, I would ask you, what is it made of? Well, it's not made of concrete, it's made of flagstone. Uh, that's, that has a warmer look to it, uh, a nicer texture than just plain concrete. So you might think of what element do you want to make your uh, sidewalk out of? Uh, you know, pavers, uh, bricks, uh, flagstone. Uh, I think we can be more creative than just plain concrete, although many of us do have a concrete sidewalk. But if you have a chance to start over, you might think of what other element you would choose for the, the sidewalk and what shape you would give it. Rather than a straight line, would you make it a curving line? Well, then finally, let's look at that front door. Excuse me, that's a beautiful front door. And you want, as I said, you want to draw attention to the front door. That should be the focal point in the public area. Well, in this case, it's a nice uh, wood grain door. Uh, you might uh, paint your front door. You know, even just adding a fresh coat of paint to your front door or a different color can accent the, the entry and give your public area a whole new look. So uh, anyway, and I might uh, point out uh, this tree on the left, that's a live oak. It really frames the view. You want to think of framing the view of the front yard. You don't want to obscure the, uh, the front door, but you want to frame the view toward the front door. And I think this live oak does a nice job of that. And you might notice that under the live oak, there is no turf in this case, and there was too much shade for uh, grass to grow. So we planted uh, some ground covers and shrubs that do well in the shade uh, instead of turf. Okay, here's the side of the house. This is what we call the service area. These are things you don't want the public to look at. Uh, you know, the, the gas meter, the air conditioning unit, uh, the electrical boxes, the recycling bin. You want to obscure these things from public view but they do constitute an area that we call the service area. And then here's the private area. This is the third part of your landscape. This is where you relax with family and friends. This is where you entertain. Uh, it needs to be an inviting area. So if I were standing in front of you, I would ask you, what looks inviting about this area? Well, several things. First of all, I would point out to you, this landscape is on a uh, corner lot in Fort Worth uh, near TCU. And there's uh, quite a bit of residential traffic on that street, but there's a great sense of enclosure in this private area. And that has been achieved through the construction of this cinder block wall. Uh, it's not a, a solid wall though, air can pass through, the breeze can pass through, uh, but there is a sense of enclosure and that's important. I, I like to enclose areas of the landscape so that they don't bleed into another area. But this area is very inviting. Uh, the pavement uh, invites us to step into that space. You've got a nice table there just waiting for you to sit at. You've got potted plants. You have plants all around the area. It's just an ideal space to unwind and, and relax and enjoy your evening with friends or family. Okay, as I said, you want to create rooms in your landscape. We do that in our house. Each room has I mean, uh, every house has different rooms. Each room has its own identity. And uh, we need to do the same in the landscape. We need to create outdoor rooms. Well, you may think to yourself, my lot is very small. I don't have much space to create rooms. Well, that may be the case. You could at least, uh, you would at least have uh, two rooms. That would be the front yard and the backyard. Now, if your backyard is big enough, you could divide it into two rooms. Uh, but certainly if you have a large space, you can easily divide that large space into more than one room. Let's look at some examples. You look at the top left. Here we are standing uh, out on this grassy area and we see these tall colander shrubs on either side of an entry that uh, beckons us to go into the next room. Okay, we see something in that next room. We see a, a piece of sculpture that, that uh, invites us to step into that space. We don't see all of that space, we just get a glimpse of that space from where we're standing. And that's what you want to do when you create outdoor rooms. Where you're standing, 
uh, you look toward the entrance into the next area and you don't want to see all of the next area, you just want to get a glimpse of it so that you're lured into that space to discover that space and see what it has to offer. You look at the top right hand picture, that's what we see there. We're on the outside of that gate and that pathway leads into the distance and we wonder where it goes. All right, there's a sense of curiosity on our part. We want to take that sidewalk into that space and discover that next room. You look at the bottom left, here we are standing inside this uh, uh, courtyard. Uh, there's a large hedge on either side of the archway and we're looking into, an out, uh, into another room. It looks as if there's a lot of grass in that next room, uh, but we can't see all of that room. So we, you know, we're invited to step under that arch into that next room to discover that next room. You look at the bottom right, uh, this is an interesting space. This is a, uh, uh, a landscape in Houston. And I would say the space we're looking at is very much the utility uh, area of that landscape. It's a huge space, but where those people are standing is a vegetable garden. And uh, where we're standing looking toward them is actually uh, kind of a working area. There's a workbench and uh, a potting shed and things like that. So that whole area, big as it is, is a utilitary, uh, utilitarian space. But it's dotted with some shrubs. Uh, that makes it interesting. Those are dwarf hill ponds uh, trimmed. They look like little gumdrops. But you want to walk around them. That creates some interest as you go through that space from where we are standing toward where the people are. So uh, it's kind of like a maze within a room. Okay, proportion. Let's look at some principles of design. There are certain principles that you need to incorporate in your landscape. You just need to know these and use them. Uh, the first one is proportion. The size relationship of various elements to each other, such as the size of a tree in relation to a house. Look at that top picture there. Uh, there's a small tree at the corner of that house. Well, if I were standing in front of you, I would ask you, does that tree look as if it's in proportion to the size of the house? And you would say, yes, I'm sure. Uh, that tree is a little bit bigger now, but still, it's a small tree, and at this point, it is very much in proportion to the size of the house. It's not it's not overpowering, it's not too big, it's, it's fine. Some of you may think it's planted a little close to the house, that's a different issue. But the, the tree itself, the, the size of the tree is in proportion to the size of the house. Look at the bottom picture. Look at that huge tree, that is a very large sycamore tree. And at the very bottom of it is a very big man. He looks small though. Uh, this guy I know is about 6'2 or 6'3 and he's about 250 pounds, he's a big guy but at the base of that tree, he looks very small. So you need to keep that in mind. If you have a small house, you don't want to plant a huge towering tree in front of your house that will dwarf your house. You want that tree uh, at its mature size to be in proportion to the size of your house. So proportion is very important in the landscape. Uh, here's something else to consider. You want to make your beds half as wide as the house is tall. So here we're looking at this house. Uh, it's a two-story house with many gables across the front. It's a big house. When I stepped into this situation, the beds were no more than three feet from the, the house. Uh, that's too small. For such a tall house, you need to bring the beds out. You want the beds to be deep. So the taller the house, the deeper the beds need to be. Uh, even with a one-story house, you don't want your beds to be only three feet deep. Uh, that's just not... Uh, that's not in proportion to the size of the house. They should be at least four, if not six feet out from the house. And foundation planting should be no more than one fourth to one third the height of the house. So I put some shrubs across the front of this house that will get about uh, two and a half to three feet tall. Uh, so they'll stay low and just hide the foundation of this house. So there we have another example of proportion. Okay, of scale. Well, this is similar to proportion. This is the relationship of size in a design to the size of the observer. That's you. That is the size of steps, walks, and doors. Now, scale can be natural or human. It can be monumental or heroic. Let's look at some examples. On the left, you see natural scale. On the right, you see monumental scale, don't you? Uh, in the picture on the left, you feel at home in that situation. You feel as if things are right for your size and your height. But you step into that space on the right, 
And how do you feel? You feel very small, very small. Well, this is a palace in Germany, and I'm sure the, uh, the, uh, the person who lived there wanted you to feel small, so as to impress upon you his power and his might. And he did that through the size of his palace. But most of us feel more comfortable in space on the left. We, we live in those spaces. Uh, we're impressed with spaces on the right, but that's not how we live. But those are two examples of scale. All right, smaller scale. Well, on the left, you see a little house that we have in the center of the uh, backyard vegetable garden at the Botanic Garden. Uh, this is uh, very much in scale with children, and it was designed for children to enjoy. Uh, they can step onto the porch, they can enter that door, and they're perfectly in scale with that size structure. You look over on the right, and there I am in front of a uh, shed. It's a dollhouse shed, but I look a little bit big for that space, don't you think? So uh, scale is important. Uh, the size relationships, how, how big or small we feel in comparison to what's around us. Okay, rhythm. Oh, this is one of my favorite principles, and you need to nail this one down. Rhythm is flow or movement in the landscape, and it's characterized by regular recurrence of elements or features in alternation with opposite or different elements or features. Basically, rhythm is a sense of movement, and you achieve movement through repetition. In other words, you want to repeat things in your landscape. Look at that bottom picture. Uh, those are tall Italian cypresses, and they are, they, uh, uh, they are alternating with weeping blue atlas cedars, okay? So it's A, B, A, B, A, B, all the way down that wall. Things are in alternation. You're repeating A, B, A, B, and so forth, okay? That repetition creates rhythm. There's a sense of movement there through that repetition. You look at the, uh, the top frame there, and that's a fence line in a backyard. And you see groupings of Nellie R. Stevens holly, Nellie R. Stevens hollies. So you see a grouping of three alternated with a grouping of roses, and then it's a grouping of three hollies, and then it's three roses, and then it's three hollies. So again, it's A, B, A, B, A, B, all the way down that fence line. You've created movement, uh, repetition, and that creates rhythm, and you want to do that in your landscape. Uh, another principle of design is unity. That's the combination of a number of elements. Uh, and we, we have a number of elements in our landscape. We just need to make sure that they work well together, that they're compatible, that they look good together. Look at that top picture there. Uh, that's a uh, landscape in Fort Worth. And uh, that's a Southwestern style house, Adobe architecture. And those plants, first of all, look good with the architecture. But look at the, the variety of plants we have there. You have a tall crepe myrtle to the back. You have a tall uh, yucca tree, uh, sword-shaped foliage. In the right corner, you have a Hollywood juniper. In the very center, you have uh, cactus, opuntia, with those pear-shaped uh, or oval-shaped pads. In the foreground, you have uh, some rosemary, Mexican feathergrass, lantana. Those are all different plants, but for some reason, they all look good together. Uh, they're very compatible. They create a nice, there's a sense of unity there. The bottom frame, You've got, uh, well, you have a tree there with a semi-circular bed or an elliptical-shaped bed around it with some dwarf yopon hollies. Behind the hollies, you have a berm with azaleas on that berm. And on the left, on the corner of the house, you have a, an upright holly, a very simple design. And then under the tree itself, within that elliptical space, you've got some bedding plants. So uh, all those things work well together. They just fit very well together. So they, there is a sense of unity there. Balance. This is very important. Uh, this is a sense of equilibrium in the landscape. And there are two kinds of balance. There are, and, and balance is always about an imaginary and sometimes not so imaginary vertical axis. And balance can be formal or informal. It can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Look at the top picture. Uh, this is the rose uh, ramp uh, in the, at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. And the imaginary vertical axis is not so imaginary. It's quite clear. All the way down the center of that picture is a cascade of water, okay? That divides the left side from the right side. And what's on the left is the same as what's on the right. So here we have an example of 
formal or symmetrical balance. You look at the picture at the bottom. This is a garden in Houston. Uh, there is an imaginary vertical axis. It's right down the middle of the picture toward that sculpture. And uh, of course, the, 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 the water fountain uh, arches over that imaginary axis. But what's on the left of that imaginary axis is the same as what's on the right. So here's another example of formal or symmetrical balance. And I'll tell you this, uh, formal and symmetrical balance uh, are very easy to achieve. You, you know, you just have to create a mirror image on both sides of that vertical axis. Very easy to achieve. What's more difficult to achieve is, oh, well, I'm sorry, I'll come to that. But here's another example of symmetrical balance. All right, here's the sidewalk that goes straight to the door. Contrast this with the uh, first picture we saw leading to the door. Uh, sidewalk leading to the door. That sidewalk was curved and made of flagstone. Here, this one is straight and it's made of concrete. It's not as interesting. You don't feel compelled to slow down and take your time to the front door. You're in a rush to get there and you can easily get there. But this is an example of symmetrical balance because what's on the left side of the sidewalk is the same as what's on the right side uh, to a great extent. Uh, a flower bed comes off that sidewalk, goes to the left, goes to the right, you have a pot on each side of the door. Uh, so this is an example of symmetrical balance. Here is a picture or an example of asymmetrical balance. More difficult to achieve, you have to be more creative, but really asymmetrical balance is more interesting. Uh, it really calls for some creativity. So here, we're looking at a sidewalk that leads straight ahead, but it dead ends in front of a window. You take a left and then you go up to the front door. So uh, there is balance here. What's on the left is not the same as what's on the right. What's on the left is plant material. There's a Japanese maple in that raised planter. There's some harbor dwarf nandinas uh, in the foreground on the left. And what's on the right is a brick wall. However, what's on the left essentially equals in mass or in weight what's on the right. So the weight of that Japanese maple and all those shrubs really equal uh, the weight of the brick wall on the right. But what's on the left is different than what's on the right. Asymmetrical balance. Okay, another principle of design, harmony. Well, that's just a state of order, agreement, or completeness. Everything looks good together, feels good, uh, there's just harmony. It, it's peaceful. It, uh, it's just nice together. It's, it's not disjointed. It's, it doesn't put you on edge. It's relaxing. It's comforting. There's a sense of harmony. And you want that in your landscape. Okay, this is another one of my favorite principles, contrast. Oh my goodness. This is one you can use uh, to full advantage. Contrast is to place or set an opposition so as to show off dissimilarities. Okay, you put A and B together. A is very different from B. But the only way you're going to appreciate A is by the difference that B has to offer. So you look at this picture here and you see an agave, a very stiff, rigid uh, plant. And then behind it is something very soft, uh, very soft textured and fine textured, the Mexican feather grass. So you have a very soft texture behind and you have that stiff, rigid texture in front contrast. But you know what? That agave would not look nearly so interesting if it didn't have the contrasting texture of the Mexican feather grass behind it. So the Mexican feather grass really sets off the, the beauty of the agave. And the stiffness of the agave really sets off the fine texture of the Mexican feather grass. So that's the beauty of contrast. One sets off the other. You notice the features of one more because of the contrasting element next to it. So uh, this is something you can use, my goodness, with color. You can use contrasting colors. You can use contrasting forms, shapes, or textures. Contrast is a wonderful principle of design to use in the landscape. All right, let's look at some elements of design. Uh, we've got five of them here. Color, line, form, texture, and focal points. Let's take a look at each of these. First of all, color. Well, everybody wants color in his landscape. Uh, uh, when I wrote my book, my publisher told me that, Steve, we need to fe feature lots of color. People want to see color. They want to see pictures. And that's what we want to see in our landscape is color. All right, you have two kinds of color. Harmony 
or contrast. Harmonious colors are achieved by using colors adjacent to each other on the color wheel. So for example, in the top picture, you know, red, uh, pink, well, red, blue, pink, you know, red, blue, pink, purple, all those are on the same side of the color wheel. Those are harmonious colors and, harm, and, and they create harmony, okay? Contrasting colors are those colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel. So red is opposite green, yellow is opposite uh, uh, purple, and blue is opposite orange. So if you really want to create a striking landscape, use contrasting colors. But if you want to create a more harmonious landscape, use harmonious colors. It's your choice. All right. Uh, color comes from a number of things, not just flowers. Uh, a lot of people just think of flowers as a source of color, but my goodness, you can achieve, you can, you can realize color through foliage, flowers, fruit, uh, and seasonal changes. So top left hand corner, uh, that colorful foliage there is ever bit as colorful as a flower bed. That's the foliage, the variegated foliage of uh, variegated tapioca. Very, very colorful, but it's just a foliage plant. You look at the top right, uh, that is the fruit of the American beauty berry. The fruit alone is very colorful. So, uh, you know, consider fruit as a source of color in your landscape. Bottom right, fall color on a tree. Bottom left, of course, color from flowers. So uh, all sorts of sources for color. Now, you can also uh, achieve color uh, from your walls, fences, paving and buildings. Top left, you've got some ferns growing in the crevices of that wall. Uh, the top right, you have some dark stones set in the midst of light colored stones to create an interesting pattern uh, that gives you some color in the walkway. Bottom right, there is color on that structure, kind of a vermilion, a vermilion red. Bottom left, you have the dark green color on the uh, steel uh, uh, lattice fence there. And I might point out that in the, in the Botanic Garden, we have a habit of painting our structures dark green, a blackish green. Uh, my former director pointed out to me that a dark color recedes, it disappears. So uh, that's the beauty of uh, this trellis here. Whatever we put on that trellis will stand out because the trellis itself, because of its color, recedes into the distance. All right, another element of design is line. Well, every, every landscape has line in it. It can be a straight line or a curving line. Line is the direction that a bed takes. It can be straight or curved. Line is enhanced with, when backed with a wall, fence, or dark green hedge. Edging helps to find the line. And I would say here in Texas, we really need to use some sort of edging in, in our line because edging separates uh, the turf from the flower bed. And uh, a lot of our grass is very opportunistic and wants to grow into the flower bed. So we need to keep the grass out of the flower bed. We do so by using edging and that edging creates line. The edging can be a straight line or a curving line. Look at the top picture, same house. This is uh, when I stepped into the situation. First of all, the house itself looks like a shoebox. It's just rectangular, just a plain, simple, rectangular shaped house. And of all things, the flower bed perfectly parallels the house. The flower bed came out about three, maybe four feet. Uh, there was a straight line there, really no interest whatsoever. So I stepped into the situation, I said, okay, let's put in some curving lines to create a little more interest, a little more drama in this boring landscape. So I put in the steel edging and it curves, it starts at the sidewalk, it curves toward the house, and then it swings out at the corner. I like to swing out on the corner. That's where you can put a, uh, a large shrub or a, a small multi-trunk tree, or maybe three, a grouping of three shrubs, but swing out on the corner. But anyway, I think the curving lines in the bottom picture makes that landscape look more interesting than just the straight lines that we see in the top picture. Okay, edging is line. Uh, the picture on the left, I install steel edging in that flower bed along the fence. Well, that edging itself creates a line. It, it serves two purposes. It creates a line. It separates the turf from the bed. Um, and notice that it's dark green, so that dark green color recedes. On the right, we also have edging. It's in the form of a concrete mow strip that separates the turf from the flower bed. And you can just run one side of your lawnmower along that mow strip and you're done. 
unless you want to go back with an edger. But uh, two different examples of edging as a line. Steve, I'm going to interject here. There's a few yes. questions about edging. Um, yes. One person asks, what kind of edging do you recommend? And the other is, what type of line would you recommend for an inverted corner? An inverted corner. Well, first of all, edging. Uh, first of all, th this question puts me on edge. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, uh, edging, it, it's very important. As I said, you really need to separate your turf from your flower bed, because if you don't, the grass will grow into the flower bed. Frankly, I like to use steel edging, and I like to use uh, 10 gauge steel edging. That's about an eighth of an inch thick. You can find thinner uh, edging, that's the 14 gauge, but it's really thin, it's very flimsy, and you'll have to replace it in about three years because it deteriorates. So if you use steel edging, I encourage you to use the thicker edging, the 10 gauge or 11 gauge. It's about an eighth of an inch thick. And the nice thing about steel edging is that it, you can bend it, you can curve it. Now, I will tell you this, it comes in dark green, I've seen it in brown, and I've seen it in black. So take your pick. I've also seen some edging that looks like uh, fake wood. It's plastic, but it looks like wood. It has a grain to it, and you can bend that as well. But whether it's steel edging or that fake wood edging, or I've even seen black plastic at you know the box stores, uh, it should be about four inches deep. You need to drive it into the ground, and you only want about an inch of your edging showing above the grade. I hate these landscapes, well, I've learned this from a, a boss several years ago. Don't let your edging ride too high above the grade. You don't want to look at the edging. You just want to see a, a bit of it. Uh, you want it to serve the purpose of separating the, the turf from the flower bed. You don't want it to draw attention to itself. Uh, so sink it in with only an inch of your edging showing above the grade. So, but you know, you could also repeat the, uh, the elements that you have on your house. If you have a stone house, you can make your edging of stone and that would bring that element out into the landscape. So have stone edging. Or if your house is a brick, you could have brick edging or brick pavers as edging. And, you're, and you would be repeating the element on your house. So it could be brick, stone, steel edging, uh, you know, any of those things. The inverted corner, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by an inverted corner. I know, so they've, they've clarified and said the corner points inward rather than outward, but that yeah, still doesn't well, clarify it for me either. Yeah, I, okay, I understand that. Yeah, so it looks as if it's, it's a, a notch in the, in, the, in the corner of the house. Well, I would still go around it. Uh, I would swing out on that corner. I would swing out and, uh, you know, even out uh, eight, 10 feet or so, and that would be the perfect space to put a small multi-trunk tree, such as a yopon holly, or a possum haw holly, or a Chinese snowball, uh, or a crepe myrtle, a multi-trunk crepe myrtle. And then back in that inverted corner itself, if you wanted to put something in, in that inverted corner, you could put three shrubs, uh, three nandinas, for example, that get three feet tall. If you wanted to fill that corner, you could fill that inverted corner with three shrubs, uh, such as uh, three nandinas that get three feet tall, but out in the, in the bed that you created by swinging out, put your multi-trunk uh, small tree there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, um, it's, kind of, it's going back to the beginning. Um, someone is asking if you could reiterate the recommended size of front garden beds in relation to the house. What if the roof is taller than the front wall? The house is two stories, but the roof comes down to the first floor. Oh, okay. Well, you know, right, uh, what did I say? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think that the bed should be, what, half the size uh, as the height of the house. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, if, you're, if you have a two-story house, but it, uh, the roof slopes down to a one-story level, then, you know, the height of the house there is about eight feet. So you'd want to come out at least four, you know, maybe six feet. Here's what I like to do. Get a rubber hose. Go outside with your rubber hose and lay out the shape of your bed. And, and you can play with it. You can play with that hose. You can move it forward or backward and until it looks right. Again, proportion is the, uh, the thing to keep in mind. You don't want it to be so close to the house that the bed looks dinky, but you don't want to come out so far from the house that, you know, you have more bed than you do turf. But, you know, for, for your standard one-story house that's, uh, you know, about eight or 10 feet tall, come out about six feet. 
That's what I would recommend. But you can play with it. With Take your hose out there and just create the line of your bed, the shape of your bed with that rubber hose, and just play with it until you're satisfied with the proportion uh, between the, the depth of the bed and the height of your house. Anything else? Uh, well, there was one more, but it was answered. Someone asked, isn't Nandina invas an invasive? And someone said, yes, Nandina is invasive. Well, let me qualify that. Uh, <laughs> some Nandinas don't bloom uh, as much as the, the standard Nandina. Uh, Nandina domestica, that's the, the general, the standard uh, run-of-the-mill Nandina that's been in the nursery industry for years. It blooms, it produces berries, and yes, birds can eat the berries and drop them elsewhere, and they will germinate. However, some Nandinas don't bloom very much at all, therefore they don't produce as much fruit. And examples of that would be Gulf Stream. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen Gulf Stream bloom. And that would also be true of Obsession and Lemon Lime. I've never seen them bloom. So if they don't bloom very much, you're not gonna have much if any fruit. So just keep that in mind. Okay, well, let's go back to line here. Here we have a couple of pictures. We've created line with plants. Look at the picture on the left. Uh, this is in Houston, so there's a bed of beautiful camellias there. We created line with a border of uh, mondo grass or liriope. And notice there's no steel edging here. I'll point that out. Uh, so somebody has to do a very good job of keeping that grass out of the flower bed by weed eating, I'm sure, weekly uh, to keep that grass from an, uh, encroaching into the flower bed. On the right, uh, line with plants. Well, first of all, my goodness, look at those, uh, those concrete mow strips there, bedding strips, edging. They lead us right to uh, a door or a balcony, a window. But we've reinforced that concrete line with a, uh, a hedge of boxwood. So we've actually created line with the boxwood hedge. And the eye is drawn directly to that window. And that is the focal point of that view, no question. Okay, form, all right. Elements, another element of design is form. The shapes of the plants. Uh, people have different shapes, so do plants. Uh, plants can be mounded, they can be pyramidal, conical, weeping. Uh, so you need to know, here's the deal, you really need to know your plant materials, uh, their shape, their form, their ultimate size before you put them in your landscape. So for example, if, if you want something pyramidal at the corner of your house, don't put something there that will grow into a ball. Uh, and I will say this about weeping plants. You have to use them sparingly, and I'll show you why. But let's look at some examples of form. Uh, look at the top left. There is the form or shape of an agave. An agave is living architecture. It's a living piece of sculpture. It's stiff. It's rigid. It looks very sculptural. Okay? On the right, you see the top right. You see uh, three uh, Mary Nell hollies. Those are pyramidal in their shape or form. So that's something that would work well on the corner of your house. Bottom right is a weeping form. That's a weeping blue atlas cedar. There are quite a few weeping plants. Uh, even in the, uh, at the Botanic Garden, we have a weeping bald cypress. We have the weeping blue atlas cedar. Uh, there is a weeping yopon. There's a weeping mulberry. A number of weeping plants. But I'll tell you this, you have to use them sparingly one is usually enough because they draw so much attention to themselves, they quickly become a focal point. I, I know of a house in my neighborhood that has a weeping Yopan holly on each corner. Well, okay, they're on each corner, that's enough, but I wouldn't want any more than that. Really, one is enough if you're using a weeping form. Uh, bottom left-hand corner, there's the mounted form of grass, an ornamental grass. And grasses are wonderful. You can use them in place of, or as you would a shrub. They're not stiff, they're not rigid, they bend, they give. So consider that as a substitute for a shrub. But you see four different uh, forms or shapes of plants there. Uh, flowers also have forms. Look at the top picture. That is a spike form. The bottom uh, picture, uh, that, plant that flower has a disc form. So uh, a circular or disc form and a, and a spiky form. And there's also contrast in color. Uh, the bluey, well, the, the purple and the yellow, they're opposite each other on the color wheel. So here, if you put these two plants together, you would have contrast in form, spike versus disc, as well as color, purple versus yellow. So consider the forms of plants, flowers, shrubs, everything. Okay, texture. This is one of my favorites. 
you've got to learn this one and use it to advantage. Uh, it's the, the surface quality of a plant. Uh, it can be coarse, intermediate, or fine. And dissimilar textures heighten the effect of each. So for example, look at this top picture. That is a leatherleaf mahonia. Very stiff, coarse, textured plant. The bottom picture is of the southern wood fern. Very fine texture. But you put those two together and you have an interesting landscape. You have coarse texture against fine texture. You have a blue green against an apple green. So texture is a wonderful, wonderful uh, element of design. And frankly, you want to use contrasting textures to heighten uh, the, uh, the qualities of each. Uh, I'll tell you this, our Japanese garden at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden is very much a green garden. That's just the nature of a Japanese garden. They don't include flower beds the way we do in Western garden design. Everything is green. You'll have a little bit of color in the spring from flowering trees and the azaleas, but the rest of the year or during the summer, everything is green. And then again in the fall, you'll have color from uh, trees and shrubs that turn colors. But for the most part, the Japanese garden is a very green garden. How do you make it interesting? How, is that, how does that not become monotonous or boring? You feature different textures of plants. This is the best way you can make your shade garden interesting. Feature different textures of plants. So you want to put coarse textured plants next to fine textured plants. You want to put that uh, leather leaf mahonia next to that southern wood fern. And all of a sudden, you've created great interest just through using contrasting textures. All right, here's a, a slide. This is a landscape I installed. I call it a tapestry of textures. I love alliteration. So anyway, uh, this man wanted to get rid of all the grass in his yard, and I did that for him. And so we planted the whole front yard with shrubs and ground covers. I put, walk, I put flagstones through there so he could walk through the landscape. So here we are under the shade of this live oak tree, and we've got uh, groupings of different shade tolerant plants. Over on the left, under that Japanese maple, you've got some, uh, uh, some ferns, ferns and nandinas to the left of the uh, border. And then you've got some mondo grass between the stepping stones to the right of the stepping stones. You've got hellebores, you've got yews, you've got some harbor dwarf nandinas, uh, all shade tolerant plants. Each of them has different textures. And that creates a very interesting landscape in that shady situation. Okay, here's another element of design, and you've got to use this one. Very important, focal points. Think about it. Every room in your house has a focal point. Uh, what is it in your, what, it is, what is it in the living room? It might be a large painting over the couch. What is it in your den? Well, it's the fireplace. Or it might be the, the picture that you have over the fireplace. Uh, in the bedroom, it might be the pictures that you have over the bed. Every room in the house has a focal point. Every room in the landscape needs to have a focal point. And a focal point is that to which the eye is drawn. Now, several focal points. Uh, it can be a structure such as an arbor, a trellis, a gazebo, or a gate. It can be an accent such as a container, a window box, a bird bath, birdhouse, statue, boulders, furniture, garden art, lighting, or accent plants. I'll never forget this house uh, in the neighborhood where I grew up. Uh, the house faced north. It was a very simple landscape. They just had English ivy all across the front. But right next to the front door was a beautiful leatherleaf mahonia coming up out of that English ivy. And it was an accent plant. It drew attention to the front door. Very simple, but very effective. Let's look at some examples of focal points. Top left, uh, there you see a, uh, well, a gazebo. Uh, top right is uh, in a garden uh, right in uh, Fort Worth, over there in Tanglewood. And you would never know it, but on the other side of those hedges is a busy intersection. But you, uh, you feel as if uh, you're shut off from the world in that space. A very good example of a room, a sense of enclosure within a landscape achieved through the hedges around that space. But in the center of that space is the focal point. It is the basin, little uh, basin. Uh, for water. There's an orb in there, a stone orb, uh, but birds can come and uh, drink from that basin, uh, preen, whatever, uh, but uh, it, that's the focal point. Bottom right, I would ask you, what is it? Well, it's the bird bath. Yes, very colorful. Something as simple as a bird bath can be a focal point, certainly in a bed. And then on the left, well, what is the focal point of that landscape? I think I know what it is, but you might have a different opinion. Uh, that's a very busy landscape. Uh, 
But I think it's that stone column in the center. That's the focal point. Now, a secondary focal point is at the base of that column. There's a stone orb on the ground. My eye's drawn to that. But even at the top, I think it's the, it's the stone column, but it could be what's on top of the column, that cascading planting. You have uh, trailing rosemary and some cactus up there. You might think uh, some focal points of that landscape are the plant material, such as the, uh, the soto, the, that is the daisy lurion in the foreground, or the agave. But I think it's right in the middle. I think it's that stone column. So anyway, those are examples of focal points. Here are some other examples of focal points. Top left, a beautiful Grecian or Roman gazebo, statues. Yes. Top right, uh, well, there's a, that's a Japanese garden. I think it's that stone pagoda on the uh, far side of that lake. Bottom right, a very formal, very simple landscape. Okay, here's an example of uh, symmetrical uh, balance. What's on the left is the same as what's on the right. There's an imaginary axis down the line, and it leads us toward the focal point. What is it? It's the bench. Yes. So uh, formal or symmetrical balance, focal point is the bench. Notice there's no grass out there. Yes, you can have a yard without grass. Bottom left picture, uh, this is a circular room, a circular space. The focal point, of course, is the statue in the center of that space. So every room in your landscape should have a focal point. Okay, let's look at some examples. Of, uh, any questions at this point before we look at some examples of design? No, no questions right now. Okay, well, we'll keep going. Uh, some examples of design. Okay, here's a house in Fort Worth over there by TCU. This is the house on, uh, on a, this is a corner lot. So now there's quite a bit of traffic that drives by, but uh, several things about this space. You, you kind of leave the world behind you and you step into that space through the gate. You're going from an outside room, that is the outside world, into another room, his yard. And you're doing that through a gate. So he has a low brick wall there with a wrought iron gate on top of it that creates a, a, a wonderful sense of enclosure. It's not, a, it's not a solid wall, so he's not closing himself off completely from the outside world. You can look through the gate and see his landscape, but you have to step into it through the gate. So let's, let's explore this landscape. Here we are up on the roof. I, I know you all get up on your roof and you look down in your landscapes. Uh, and that's what we're doing in this picture here. And you can see uh, he is on a corner lot. And I would ask you, uh, what is the focal point in this space? Well, it's the water fountain. Then I would ask you, is this an example of formal design or informal? Well, I would get answers from, I would get answers both ways. I think it's a formal design, that is the grid. The grid is formal because you have a concrete sidewalk that comes into the space, makes a 90 degree turn, and then off that concrete sidewalk, you have decomposed granite, DG, uh, that forms other sidewalks or other walkways. But th so the grid itself is very formal, 90 degree turns, that's formal. However, I think the overall landscape looks informal because of the palette of plant material. These are mostly native plants. They give it a very soft look. So those, that, that, that palette of native plant material softens that formal grid and almost gives the landscape an informal look. But the focal point is the water fountain. And I will say this about DG, decomposed granite. It's a wonderful element in the landscape. If you want uh, to form walkways out of that, uh, when you walk on it, it crunches and it makes a nice sound. And that just adds another nice feature to your landscape, that, that crunching sound of decomposed granite beneath your feet as you walk through the landscape. But if you do use decomposed granite in your landscape, by all means, put down landscape fabric first, put your DG on top of it because you don't want your DG embedding itself in the dirt. And if you should ever remove it at some point, you'd have to dig it all out. So put a landscape fabric down first, put your decomposed granite on top of that and you're good to go. Okay, here we are looking at this landscape. Well, it's a shady lot, and I will tell you this. Uh, shady lots are inviting in Texas. Uh, we're drawn to the shade, you know. Anytime we're in a parking lot, we try to find a tree that we can park under, and it's, it's a pleasure to step into a shady landscape. They're cooler, they're refreshing, and plants are not as stressed uh, because of the shade. However, sometimes it's a challenge 
to find shade tolerant plant material. That's another issue. But anyway, here we are looking at this landscape. Uh, yeah, he still, even with his decomposed granite, he makes 90 degree turns. So there's a formal grid to the landscape, uh, but then it's softened with all these native plants in the foreground. You've got the white fruiting American beautyberry. You've got Southern wood fern. Notice, let's, let's look for that uh, principle of rhythm. Rhythm is repetition. I would ask you to look for things that are repeated. Do you see things that are repeated? I do. I see the uh, Japanese holly fern repeated. I see it in one spot, I see it in another spot. I see columbine repeated. I see southern wood fern repeated. I see turk's cap repeated. Here's the deal. You don't want one of anything. That's called a confetti garden. When you just have one of this and one of that, we call that a confetti garden. You want to avoid that. So you want to repeat certain things in your landscape. Repetition. You want to plant in groups. So, you know, five of this, five of that, five of this. Groupings of things. And, uh, and feature those groups more than once, as he has done here. All right, here we are looking at the front porch. That's not the front door. That's the French door, but it's not the front door, but that is the front porch. And to the right, we see some Japanese holly ferns. Uh, notice in front of the porch, he has boulders. One is upright, one is horizontal. That's interesting. Kind of a focal point there to the edge of the porch. And then he planted Mexican petunias in front of it. He has Turk's cap around it. He put Turk's cap in his pots. Over on the left is the only grass you will see in his landscape. He's got some zoysia turf over there. Uh, he eliminated grass from the rest of his landscape uh, and, and planted shrubs and perennials that grow well in the shade of his trees. Okay, here we are looking at the private area. Let's go back to, well, we can examine this for several things. This is the private area, so that's one room of his landscape. Do you see a focal point? Of course you do. It's the dinner bell. That, that bell is the focal point of the landscape. Do you see repetition? Yes, you do. Uh, Turk's cap, I see it in the pots, I see it in the beds. I see Japanese holly fern repeated. I see liriope repeated. Yeah, so repetition creates rhythm a sense of movement in the landscape. Okay, here's the landscape in Fort Worth as it used to appear. It has since been revised, but there's several good things about this landscape as we see it. First of all, the house is a Southwestern style house, Adobe style architecture. Your landscape should look good with your house. Okay, I think this landscape looks very good with that style of house. So, uh, Yes, your landscape should be compatible with your style of architecture. Keep that in mind. But anyway, let's look at this picture here. So let's see in front of that wall, that stucco wall, we've got Texas sage, that's that gray shrub, leucophyllum. You've got some uh, rosemary over there on the left. You have lots of lantana, native lantana. Uh, down toward the right end of the picture, uh, are the plants that we saw earlier as an example of unity, the cactus, the crepe myrtle, the juniper, those plants. But all these plants look very good with that style of house and uh, yeah, fits very well together. Okay, here we are looking at the front door. There's a desert willow to the left of that door. I see lots of rosemary, uh, uh, lantana, the Texas sage, yeah, good choice of plant material. Looks very Southwestern. Well, I don't know why I included this slide, but this is just uh, a bed in somebody's backyard. I will point out the edging. Uh, the lawn is separated from the bed and it's uh, separated by the steel edging. And notice that steel edging doesn't stick up very high. I only see about an inch of it above the grade. That's what you want. You don't want to look at the steel edging itself. You just want to see the top of it. But there's a nice collection of plants in that bed, uh, red yuccas, Russian sage, American beauty berry, just a nice collection. Again, I'm not sure why I included this picture, but that gives you an idea of what somebody put in his bed in the backyard. Okay, several things I like to point out in this picture. Well, uh, this is the side of a house. Okay, and this was a gated community and everybody's yard looked the same, everybody had grass and sheared shrubs. 
and then this couple moved in and said, you know what, we want a different look. We want natives, we want a softer, more natural look. So my friend, the landscaper, stepped in, got rid of all the grass, and, and planted a lot of native plants. Well, first of all, I see repetition. I see Turk's cap in three different places. I see southern wood fern repeated. I see salvia grecii repeated. So there's repetition. There's not just one of this and one of that. He has repeated his plant materials. Repetition creates rhythm, and you want that in your landscape. Uh, there's one thing in this picture that bothers me. I always ask students what it is. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you since you can't tell me, but it's the steel edging behind the curb. Frankly, I think the curb itself creates edging. I don't see the need to put steel edging behind a curb and it sticks up so high anyway, it just stands out like a sore thumb. I know why they put it there. They put it there to hold back the mulch. What I like to do though, in that case, is dig down below the curb so the soil line is below the curb and then when you put mulch on top of your soil even the mulch is not over the top of the curb so just keep that in mind something to think about okay let's look at this picture here we have a landscape in west fort worth and these are some pretty big lots and everybody in that neighborhood had basically the same look saint augustine grass and live oak trees. Well, St. Augustine, first of all, turf consumes a lot of water in the landscape. It, it, it's a water guzzler, but especially St. Augustine, that's really a water guzzler. So this lady was, uh, she was wanted to try something new and different. She wanted to get rid of all the turf. She wanted a more natural look. She's an organic gardener. So she wanted, uh, she wanted butterflies and hummingbirds and anoles in her landscape. She didn't want to use any pesticides. So she called my friend in, the, the landscaper, and he came in and decided to do something with her landscape. And he did. Well, first of all, he got rid of all that grass. So let's see what he did. Yes, top left. Uh, so there we have some Adirondack chairs under that oak tree. Uh, they're sitting on top of some decomposed granite, DG. A nice place for the family to sit and watch all the neighbors go by as the neighbors admire their beautiful landscape. Uh, bottom left picture. Well, under that live oak, there is no more any grass. Uh, there's some mondo grass, and then there's a nice big bed of inland sea oats. That's a native grass that tolerates shade. Inland sea oats, very shade tolerant, tolerates dry shade, uh, and it serves very well as a, as a uh, ground cover there. Top right picture, oh, look at this. What he did, he took some big slabs of stone and just jammed them into the, the side of her hill, of her, of her sloped lawn, so that you, you, you create different levels in the landscape now. So you can walk up the steps to the higher level and that's closer to the house and then you can walk down to the lower level closer to the street. Wonderful idea. And it introduces stone, which itself has beautiful color and texture and warmth. And then he surrounded it with plant material. Look at the top picture. Uh, really, his color scheme are uh, the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Uh, that blue uh, salvia there is, uh, I think it's indigo spires. And then the yellow is uh, new gold lantana. And then in the left for, uh, foreground, you've got some red Turk's cap. So red, yellow, and blue. My goodness, a butterfly magnet, a hummingbird magnet. magnet. Uh, it's just wonderful. And the neighbors didn't even complain. All right, here's my friend in Arlington. Yes, on the left before. A sloped lawn, he was tired of all the grass. He said, I'm willing to get rid of the grass. I said, I'll do that for you. So I killed it and uh, installed what you see on the right. Uh, from the curb about halfway up, I did plant a ground cover that is purple winter creeper. That's Euonymus coloratus fortunii, purple winter creeper. Uh, it's evergreen, it holds the slope very well, it turns purple in the winter. And then you see a serpentine planting of kaleidoscope abelias. And then behind it, you're really in the shade and you know, uh, that's where I planted the yews and the nandinas and the oak leaf hydrangeas and all that stuff. But anyway, the top picture, you're looking toward the front door. 
Yes, so on either side of the walkway, you can see the ground cover. And, and at that time, I still planted roses. I don't plant roses anymore. They have trouble with rose rosette virus, you know that. But I did plant a grouping of them on either side of the sidewalk there to give a little bit of color uh, leading up to the front door. But on the right, I featured a lot of perennials, uh, salvia gregii, Russian sage, red yuccas, uh, some dwarf pomegranate shrubs. Okay, just some more pictures there on the left is before and on the right after. So I basically replaced the turf with shrubs and ground cover. And just more pictures there. Yeah, I just planted the whole thing in ground cover and shrubs. So he didn't have to mow anymore in the front yard. He was glad. All right, here's the shoebox house. On the left, you see the beds only came out about three, maybe four feet, and they perfectly parallel the house, no interest, no drama. So I came in and I used steel edging to separate the lawn from the beds, and I swung out on the corners. I used curving lines, which I think add, adds a lot more interest and drama to that landscape. Okay, here's that house we've seen before. Uh, on the left is uh, before, on the right is after. It had suffered some neglect. Uh, the beds fell into a state of disrepair. So I came in and ripped out a lot of stuff and replaced it with beds and brought the beds out deeper and just made things look better. Steve, there was a question about inland sea oats. Um, yeah. Someone's saying that it's taking over their garden. How can they manage it? Well, that's because the other common name for inland sea oats is endless sea oats. Yes. Well, we cannot call it we cannot call it uh, invasive because it's native. But I will say this, it reseeds prolifically. So yes, it will take over an area. Uh, you just have to keep that in mind. It, it does reseed prolifically. Uh, I don't mind using Roundup to control those seedlings. Uh, that's how I keep mine in check. Uh, so, but something to consider before you plant inland sea oats. Uh, what are you gonna do with all the seedlings that come up and how will you keep them in bounds? Anything else? No. Mm -mm. Okay. All right, just some more before and after pictures. Uh, you know, we went from one extreme to the other. Uh, shrubs and mulch. Oh yeah, you want to mulch uh, after you plant. Absolutely essential here in, in North Central Texas. Uh, uh, so after you plant, uh, you want to put, uh, you know, two inches of an organic mulch on top of the ground. That can be shredded hardwood mulch or pine bark mulch or cypress mulch, but you need something to cover that bare ground. It inhibits weed growth. Uh, weeds just won't come up through it. It retains moisture in the soil. Um, it stabilizes soil temperature. Uh, the temperature won't fluctuate as much with two inches of mulch on top of the ground. And it makes your, gives a nice finished look to the landscape. And most importantly, it makes your beds look mulch better. That was good. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes, I, I'm sure you're mulch obliged. Uh, mulch. So anyway, yes, just some more before and after pictures here. On the left, boy, look how uh, decrepit that landscape looks. It had really fallen into a state of disrepair. On the right, I uh, notice how I create line. We talked about line before. Well, I certainly created a line with those baby gem boxwoods, a little hedge there. That's what they wanted. They wanted a formal look, and I gave them that look with the baby gem boxwoods. <clears throat> Excuse me. With perennials planted in front. Okay, I love this house here. Uh, it's uh, in Fort Worth. You know, Babylon had its hanging gardens. Well, this house has its terraced gardens. Four different levels, in fact. When I stepped into the situation, the homeowner was going, uh, he, he still had turf on, on those terraces, except the bottom terrace. And he was taking his lawnmower and dropping down from one terrace to the next. I said, let's just eliminate that. Why go, why, why even get up there with your lawnmower and mow those terraces? So we got rid of the grass on the upper terraces and I just planted it full of perennials and things like that. But anyway, here in this bed along the driveway, you see adagio grass uh, forming a backdrop to those uh, knockout roses. Those roses are still healthy, by the way. Why they are, I don't know, but they're still hanging on. But anyway, uh, here's an example of, of an ornamental grass as a substitute for a shrub. You can use a grass as you would a shrub. 
So it forms a beautiful backdrop for the roses. And uh, summer through fall and winter, you've got those nice tan colored plumes on the, uh, uh, on the grasses. Adds great texture and interest to the bed. And uh, anyway, one level, uh, 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 let's see, the lowest level I planted uh, perennials and so forth. The next level up, I planted red yuccas. And then at the very top, you see the fall asters blooming. I know this picture was taken in October because the fall asters are blooming, they're purple. Okay, let's look at some other things about this. Here you see the roses. In the foreground, you see the uh, Powers Castle Artemisia, silver colored uh, foliage plant. Uh, that just fits beautifully in landscapes. It looks good with pinks, purples, reds. It's a nice filler plant. That's how it's functioning here. Okay, here you are looking at uh, all the terraces. There is some turf on the, the lower level in front of us. Pockets of roses. Again, that's an example of repetition. So by repeating the roses in the landscape, we created rhythm. Okay, you achieve that through repetition. Uh, and actually, we've repeated some other plant materials as well, and that creates rhythm within this landscape. Okay, here's a house. Uh, happens to be my house. So let's look at this. What do you think of that lawn there? Beautiful, I'm sure. Uh, actually, uh, and you might think it's uh, Bermuda grass, but it's not. Everybody else in the neighborhood has Bermuda grass, but I chose buffalo grass. And at the time, it looked nice. Uh, but buffalo grass is a very fine textured grass. It's a native grass, uh, and, and I wanted to use it because I wanted a low water use landscape. Everything in this landscape is native, and I wanted to include uh, native buffalo grass, so I did. Uh, but it, get, it, it got thinner and thinner and thinner, and uh, I just I couldn't keep the weeds out of it. But anyway, let's, let's look at some other elements here. I like a sense of a delineation, so I don't like my landscape to bleed into the next landscape. That's why I put up that split rail fence on the property line. That just creates a, a line in the sand, if you will, between the next door neighbor's yard and mine, so that my yard has its own identity separate from everybody else's. So I still have turf at this point, uh, used a curving line there, featured lots of native plants, salvia gregii, agaves. The little tree on the left over there, that is the uh, western siltberry. There's a little tree next to the front door, that's the Texas mountain laurel. The tree on the right, you may wonder why I put a tree there. I'll tell you why, because that is the two-story part of the house, and that was a, th there's a very sharp corner there, a very sharp corner, and I didn't want to look at that sharp corner. I wanted to soften it, so I put a Texas ash there, which very nicely softens that sharp edge all the way down. So let's see what else happens here. Anyway, the grass still looks nice at this point. Agaves, uh, salvia gregii, uh, the grass is over there on the fence line. That's uh, uh, Lindheimer's muley. Notice in front of the door, I saved that spot for seasonal color. You always want to put color near your front door, color that you can change out. So you're going to have some color there in the summer. You can have different color there in the winter. So in the summer, I put zinnias or lantana or whatever. In the summer, I, in the winter, I would plant pansies, snapdragons, kale, any of that stuff. And notice on the, the very left, in the left-hand corner, that strip between the sidewalk and the curb, I planted red yuccas there, Hesperalo parviflora. Very low water use plant. Okay, here we are looking at the house. You see the red yuccas are blooming, split rail fence and all that, it all looks good. That's when the house was tan. I've since painted it green, it looks much better green. Anyway, look at that salvia gregii blooming along the driveway. This plant is native to West Texas, gets about two and a half feet tall. I love it. It blooms red, white, pink, or coral. So I chose the coral. I thought the coral looked good with the brick. And here it is blooming. It blooms heavily in the spring, sporadically during the summer, and then again heavily in the fall. Okay, east side of the house. These are all natives except for the Shantung maple. I did put a maple tree there because I wanted it to reach up and shade the second story window. But you've got white salvia gregii. I've got, uh, well, I have Turk's cap in there. I have our native palm over there on the right. See that palm? That is sable minor, dwarf yopon holly. And to the left of the palm, I have a mixture of coral berry and in inland sea oats. Okay, all native stuff. I don't have irrigation in my landscape, so I water by hand or I just put an oscillating sprinkler out there and that's how I water things. Very low water use landscape. Okay, here's the backyard on the left. Uh, well, let's see, yeah. 
I still had the buffalo grass then. And that bed over there, you wonder why it swings out like that? Well, there used to be a trampoline there. When the kids outgrew the trampoline, I just turned that into a flower bed. But I planted the Nellie or Stevens hollies along the fence. They make a nice screen. I like a sense of enclosure. I don't like people looking into my backyard. So I put the Nellie or Stevens against the back so the house behind me wouldn't be looking into our yard. And uh, you can see the dead grass over there. That's where I sprayed with Roundup uh, because I'm killing that out and I'm just gonna plant more shrubs and perennials over in there so that my grass is just right out there in the middle. And there you can see the, uh, the effect on the right. I painted the shed green, which I think looks better. The purple asters look nice in front of it. Uh, so there you see that landscape in the fall. Okay, here we have the front. Oh boy, what did I do now? I got rid of the, I got rid of the grass. That's what I did, yes. Uh, the, the, the buffalo grass just continued getting thin. I couldn't keep the weeds out of it. So I just created a cottage garden and I planted the whole front yard really with uh, coral, uh, with the, uh, uh, the carpet roses. And this is coral, the carpet roses. They lasted for three years. They were beautiful, but they got rose rosettes. So I dug them up and I replaced them with something else. But you see elsewhere in that landscape, I have coral salvia gregii, and then I have the red yuccas between the curb and the sidewalk. They also have coral flowers. So coral was my theme, kind of my color theme. And I tried to balance that by putting some blue or purple in there. And anyway, so there you see, I put a pathway through there. Again, it's a curving pathway that makes you slow down a little bit and take in what's on either side. Uh, the, uh, the, the carpet roses still have the Lindhammer's muley grass, the uh, coral uh, salvia gregia, the agaves. The shrub on the right, the yellow shrub, that is Abelia kaleidoscope. The only thing that's not native. Steve, okay, we've got quite I a few questions piling up. Do you mind if I give them some of you, uh, yes, give, yes. give you some of them. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, one person asked what was used to remove the grass. It sounds like Roundup, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, another person asked, what is a good companion plant with dwarf yopon holly shrubs? Okay. Well, um, yeah, dwarf yopon holly shrubs, uh, they can get, you know, two to three, even up to four feet tall. Mm -hmm. My goodness, you could use a number of things with them. You could use salvia gregii. You could use grasses with them. You could use the, uh, there's a grass called adagio, or you could use Lindheimer's muley. Grasses would be very pretty uh, behind. For example, the Lindheimer's muley will get about four feet tall. So that would make a nice backdrop between, behind your dwarf yopon holly. And then in front of your dwarf yopon holly, put the salvia gregii. It blooms red, white, pink, and coral. Mm -hmm. Um, the last question I have, uh, let's see, it's about mulch. Do you prefer hardwood or cedar or another type? They want you to go into the pros and cons of each. I feel like that could be a little lengthy, um, but well, do you do use this? I'll, I'll, I'll do it quickly. Yeah. Okay. Frankly, I like shredded hardwood. I like, I like, I like a mulch that's dark. You want the mm -hmm. mulch to recede. You don't want a light colored mulch that stands out. I don't want the the, the mulch to take center stage. I want the plants to take center stage. I want the mulch to recede. So I use a dark mulch. I like shredded hardwood. As with any organic mulch, you will have to replace it or replenish it about every two years. So I like you, I, I like uh, uh, shredded hardwood. I also like pine bark mulch, but you have to be careful. You don't want big nuggets. Big nuggets will float away. You'd, pine bark mulch can float. That's the nice thing about shredded hardwood. It doesn't float away. Cypress mulch does not float away, but it's light colored, kind of a bleached blonde. Uh, and it, it's a light color. So you have to be okay with that, but it stays in place. Cedar mulch is wonderful. That's the Cadillac of the mulches. No, the Cadillac, no, the Mercedes of the mulches would be pecan mulch. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, it's expensive though, but it's very pretty. And cedar mulch is good. Cedar mulch has some insecticidal properties, so that might keep termites, termites away from your house. Yeah, so there are also, those are some advantages. Okay, that's it for questions for now. Um, okay, well, let's go back to this. As you see, my landscape evolves. I change things out. So anyway, I got rid of the roses, and then I replaced them with new gold lantana, which has come back for me year after year, and it's beautiful. Uh, notice how that whale's tongue agave is getting bigger. And then I put a, a Yopan Ali uh, uh, left uh, to the left of the picture there. But anyway, the new gold lantana blooms all summer long. I have butterflies all over it. It's a great pollinator plant. Notice behind the, the lantana and in front of those kaleidoscope shrubs, 
I kept a, a pocket of color there that I change out. So I, it looks orange now. Those are marigolds that I planted for the fall. And notice I painted the house green. I think it looks better green. So anyway, yeah, so I still have that, that one bed back there that I change out seasonally. I'll put something in for winter, something in for spring, something in for summer. But uh, the new gold lantern has done very well. And as I said, it attracts butterflies. So then here we are. Yes, those are marigolds. Those are Tai Shan orange marigolds that were beautiful in the fall. I love having that one spot there just for seasonal color changeouts. And it took 100 uh, to put there. Okay, so then, and then I really got crazy. Here's my winter landscape. I planted the whole front yard in pansies and charanthus. So behind the stepping stones, behind the flagstones, I planted the mixed charanthus. And then in front of them, I, I pulled out one of the colors of the charanthus and I planted a solid planting of the orange pansies. So, and I really like that charanthus. It blooms all winter long and it is so sweetly uh, scented, a very fragrant, uh, uh, plant in your landscape. Bees will be all over it on warm winter days. And then of course the orange pansies in the front. So there you've got a very colorful landscape. And notice the color of those kaleidoscope abelias. They turn kind of a copper orange color in the winter. Hence the name kaleidoscope. They go through a color change. And then come summer they go back to yellow and green. Well, I guess it's time to stop. So yes, <laughs> I'll take any remaining questions. Okay, so um, let's let them kind of sifting through them. One question is, uh, what uh, is a good pathway material for wheelchair accessibility? Good question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, you know, I think the DG, well, I don't know. Well, I guess the harder, the better, really. You don't want your, you don't want the wheels to sink down into your uh, pathway. <clears throat> we had that problem in the garden. We had a mulch pathway and it was a little bit difficult for uh, wheelchairs. So the harder, the better. Flagstone would be ideal. Flagstone or pavers. Mm -hmm. Flagstone or pavers. Uh, I, I would be willing to say the, the decomposed granite. Uh, put down your landscape fabric and then put two inches of decomposed granite on top. But still, your, your wheels can sink a little bit in that decomposed granite. So your best bet would be flagstone or pavers. OK. Um, another question is, what direction does your front yard face? South. South, OK. Um, there's another question about your yard. Uh, what were the larger privacy shrubs you showed in your backyard? Those were Nellie R. Stevens hollies. Nellie R. Stevens hollies. Okay. Work. They will get 20 feet tall. Woo. No, they will. All right. Uh, and it looks like the last question, any thoughts or guidance on foodscaping? I think that could be a whole, that'll be a whole other topic that we'll try to get someone to, to teach. No, that's food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sir, let, let me just throw something in on that. Uh, seriously, edible landscapes are the rage now. You can have a, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, but anyway, throw in some edible plants. For example, blackberries can function as a shrub. Throw in some dill uh, or fennel. Uh, even tomato plants interspersed among your landscape. Uh, pomegranates uh, are edible. Uh, you know, some fruit trees. So you can incorporate some uh, fruits and vegetables into your landscape. Yeah, and have an edible landscape. Anything else? Are we through? Steve, can you hear me? Oh, I can now, yes. Okay, I had a little connection issue. Okay. Uh, what is your, this is the last question, and we'll, we'll end with this. What is your favorite plant nursery? Well, it's a wholesale nursery. Uh, it's Southwest Wholesale Nursery in Carrollton. They have everything. But uh, for retail nurseries, well, you know, you, there's several. Uh, there's Weston Gardens down in Southeast Fort Worth. One of my favorite nurseries is Stewart's Nursery on the west side. They're over there uh, on, actually they're east of Weatherford in what mm -hmm. is that, Hudson Oaks or Willow Park, you know, somewhere in there. They're on, mm -hmm. yeah, Stewart's Nursery, yes. Uh, and then, you know, you, you've got Callaways, you've got Archie's on Camp Bowie. So there are a number of good ones around town. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, everyone, um, first of all, thank you, Steve. This was very informative. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and if you are interested in classes going forward in the summer, you can visit our website. Um, I put the link uh, in the chat earlier. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again. So thank you guys.